Good afternoon, um, everyone, and welcome. Uh, good afternoon from London, UK. Um, good morning to those in US and Canada, and good evening for anyone in the Middle and Far East. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, do use the chat. We'll take questions at the end. Um, if we can't answer all the questions in the time we've got, um, we will deal with them uh, when it, on the recording. Uh, it's best if you mute your, um, mute your mics while the events, while speakers are taking place uh, and the videos off probably during that time. Um, so this webinar is organized by the CIBS Intelligibility Group in conjunction with the CIB. And for those of you not so familiar with CIB, it's the International Council for Research and Innovation in Building and Construction. It's been going since 1953. It has uh, uh, at least 40 commissions on various aspects of design, uh, production, uh, and research in, in many, many areas. Overall, overall, we're concerned with sustainability, integrating processes involved in what we do, and resilience of, of urbanization. Uh, there is a world building conference in June 2022, which is being run at the uh, RMIT University in Melbourne. And if you Google the CIB, you'll, you'll see something about that. I would also like to, to greet members from the Continental Automated Buildings Association, uh, which is in North America. I think it's uh, started in Canada originally. Uh, and it's very, we're very welcome to, uh, if anyone's on the line from there, then it's very nice you're, you're with us. This afternoon, we've got three speakers, uh, Neil Pennell from Landsec. Uh, we've got Phil Obeda from uh, SOM. And, and it gives me great pleasure to invite Kankana Khan from Frost and Sullivan in Toronto to open with her presentation. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Good morning and good evening to everyone. Uh, can, can you hear me, um, Phil, if you could, um, Derek, Phil, one of you, if you could just confirm. Yeah, yeah. OK, great. Um, so thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present here and um, uh, welcome everyone to our version of this presentation. <clears throat> so, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So I'll just quickly give you a brief background of who we are uh, at Frost & Sullivan. We are a growth consulting company, but at the same time, uh, we're a global research and consulting organization that has been uh, in this practice for over 50 years now. I'm based here out of uh, Toronto. I work as part of our consulting group and uh, my responsibilities uh, include um, supporting our, our industry clients uh, in consulting activities, but also promoting some of the thought leadership activities that we participate in a collaborative basis with industry organizations just like yourself. Uh, and of course, the Continental Automated Buildings Association here in uh, North America. Um, at Frost & Sullivan, of course, we've been in the forefront of uh, all of these activities that have unfolded with the uh, unprecedented events around COVID-19, particularly uh, those that relate very closely to the energy industry, the environmental industry, and the buildings industry. This is my area of focus. I've been with Frost for over 14 years, um, and this has been my um, area of interest and focus uh, through all of these uh, years at Frost & Sullivan. Uh, we have worked with a number of organizations supporting a lot of the reset rebound activities, particularly uh, at the enterprise side, but also we've worked with a lot of the regulatory organizations supporting them with the data, the facts, uh, to create those guidelines and reset measures. And we are actually very closely involved with a number of uh, organizations within the building technologies industry. We did, of course, look at the economic impact. I mean, this is this is obviously bread and butter for our industry, but also many industries that are, um, you know, horribly affected by this uh, global pandemic. Um, based on our forecast, of course, we are 
uh, projecting a turnaround for most of the industry segments, the product segments, particularly th those that relate closely to the building technology industry to be uh, in the revival mode, uh, kicking in towards the third quarter of 2021. Globally, um, this is, of course, you know, the worst case scenario that we have looked at. We have looked at previous pandemics, uh, done a comparison, and we, uh, we feel that the impact that we are experiencing today from uh, COVID-19, particularly with the fact that, you know, today as we speak, this is uh, practically uh, escalated to the global emergency uh, limits. And overall, uh, the turnaround that is expected for um, the economies, as well as, you know, global GDP revival for many countries that are affected, and more particularly, the industry segments that impact the building environment uh, is, is going to be extremely slow and the revival is only projected towards the end of um, 2021 and by and large of course as i said i mean many industries are going through extreme negative impact of covid-19 however there are some positives and quite frankly the building this industry is one of them where we certainly see significant amount of opportunities that could emerge in terms of creating resiliency uh, within the built environment, being able to cater to the new uh, requirements of the workforce, uh, as well as the technology challenges that are going to be uh, front and center of this industry going forward in terms of creating those and future proofing our buildings really. So we look at a variety of industries, particularly those that have a very close impact um, to the built environment. And because of my focus within the energy and environment space, of course, we look at the crossover impact that comes from all of these different uh, interrelated segments and sectors that impact the built environment. And how do they sort of collaboratively impact uh, the um, uh, the the functions, the, the uh, responsibilities, the roles and responsibilities that the cities have to deliver in an uh, urban environment. Um, obviously, within the built environment itself, um, alternate workspace pretty much became an overnight reality, as we saw with um, you know, what happened to the, 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 the lockdowns um, and the requirements around the lockdown that uh, kicked in globally uh, back in February and March. Uh, overall, of course, this this required tremendous amount of recalibration of um, you know hard technologies within the built space, creating alternate workspaces, uh, re, you know, allowing for some of the physical technologies within the building to synchronize more and more with environmental quality conditions and safety, etc. Overall, I think this is this is something that um, is going to continue for a very long time. It's only you know starting now, and there are safe start strategies that are being put in place by various organizations around the world. <clears throat> On the energy supply and uh, demand side, also we are seeing tremendous amount of um, uh, you know new changes. Uh, there is, of course, a uh, very stringent uh, scrutiny around uh, supply chain innovation, for instance, which is also going to have a critical impact on how our buildings function going forward. And overall, what we are seeing is that for every single industry, there is a tremendous amount of requirement for building in those um, uh, innate, you know, self-sufficiency measures, self-corrective measures, and collective healing is really one of the uh, ways forward for any single industry, and particularly so for the built environment. Um, within the intelligent building space, I mean, there are very uh, specific areas that we, you know, obviously look at uh, as our industries deal with this uh, imminent slowdown and the fundamental shifts that uh, COVID-19 has brought about. There are obviously distinct challenges which uh, the built environment is facing today and the ecosystem of solution partners that uh, cater to this space. And clearly the emerging future scenario could uh, magnify this um, well well beyond what we have imagined today. Uh, when we talk of dealing with COVID-19 challenges, mitigation measures for our buildings, uh, there are three main areas to address. So these measures have to be capable of handling the airborne viral load, uh, the surface borne viral load, and the behavioral viral load that uh, impacts this space. And that encompasses um, a, a variety of things. So firstly, we have to look at repurposing the buildings themselves, you know, reversing the open office concept that we uh, propagated in the last uh, decade. 
And so this presents um, tremendous redesign challenges, refurbishing requirements to be undertaken for owners and occupants. And, and then added to that is the, the recalibration of systems and controls to fit the new occupancy patterns, for instance, in our buildings. And that is something that uh, a lot of this, um, uh, you know, is, is currently being addressed by different organizations and associations like, for instance, in, in North America, ASHRAE has laid down certain guidelines. Uh, the American Industrial Hygiene Society have laid down certain safe start strategies for facility managers to follow. So these are going to be very critical uh, going forward. And these are only the baseline requirements that we're seeing today. Um, this could tremendously change and new requirements could very well find their way into these guidelines going forward. Uh, the critical measures, of course, concerning cleaning, sanitation, um, addressing indoor air quality, environmental quality challenges, uh, trying to go touch free, contact free when it comes to vertical transportation systems, for instance, or access control into buildings. Um, the, 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 the most immediate areas that are being looked at are obviously all of these. Now, from here, we will see more integration of biosensors, for instance, for pathogen detection, uh, integration of such, te such technology into our mobile devices, uh, mandatory. Uh, antimicrobial interior uh, finishes for buildings, for instance. So these are also going to be critical requirements going forward. However, all of this comes with tremendous amount of hindrances uh, in terms of you know, shortages of working capitals, um, wage liabilities, for instance. FM companies are trying very hard to respond, um, uh, to become response ready, and whether or not uh, the, the, the limited budgets would allow for such technology changes uh, that our buildings will or warrant for dealing with COVID-19 is really a very uh, huge question that is looming large for our industry today. So uh, if we go to the um, next slide. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so what I wanted to discuss here a little bit is in terms of the key predictions that um, we are are starting to, um, you know, address right now. So, I think one of the concerns, uh, just as we, you know, emphasized a lot on health and air quality, etc., for our buildings, soon as the uh, the lockdown procedures kicked in, I think one of the concerns. Um, that has uh, been, you know, pretty um, uh, uh, important for us to look at is, you know, will energy, energy efficiency take a backseat in all of this? Because now we are suddenly emphasizing so much more on health and critical uh, welfare issues for our buildings. Uh, well, we think that building managers will look for uh, energy management solutions that go beyond occupant comfort and sustainability. It has to at some point synchronize with emergency response support, for instance. So the ability to recalibrate uh, environmental quality um, is, is critical from the EMS to support pandemic ready needs. Uh, we are also going to witness connected security and safety preparedness uh, plug into the EMS, for instance. So exploring some of the pandemic ready use cases will become mandatory for real estate developments because we now have to be ready with um, for instance, pop-up infrastructure to support pandemic re related requirements. So either as a dedicated wing or a standalone unit in a campus, uh, complete with environmental uh, calibration will be necessary to maintain even accreditations for these buildings. So all the rating solutions, the rating systems that we have here, whether it's a reset standard or a well building standard or the lead standard, for instance, will eventually be looking at some of these requirements for accreditation of these buildings as well. However, I think the digital empowerment of the ecosystem is also very, very important here and the ability to deliver these solutions in real time via digital transformation of both um, internal businesses of, of people within the ecosystem of the built environment and the client ready solutions that will hold the key for success for uh, solution partners and uh, the, the industry solution providers. Um, but along with that, I think one of the critical changes that we are going to see is the big change that it has brought about to the workforce and the workplace. So an interesting outcome of all of this is how the workplace will cater to the workforce. As we saw, 
uh, work from home became the overnight reality for all companies. So not only workplace requirements will change, but the workforce itself will undergo uh, transformations and new employment models will emerge to cater to these changes. Uh, what I'm sharing here is from a very recent um, in-depth research that we undertook to look at the future of the workforce and the workplace post-COVID. Um, connectivity will continue to drive both workplace changes as well as uh, emerging employment models. Now, uh, some of these models have already been successfully implemented, so, uh, so they have taken off, for instance, you know, freelance brokering, for instance, or even an uncolored model. So Uber probably is one of the best examples for this. However, going forward, I think it will be models like microtasking, dispersed networks uh, that will unlock the maximum potential for corporations and our buildings and technologies that go into them will need to uh, revamp to address these uh, changing requirements of the workplace and the workforce. Uh, so what we have traditionally seen, uh, you know, the headquarter, um, the, the satellite offices around it, the project office or the co-working workspace, all of that is now immediately transforming into a network of, um, you know, project offices, virtual offices, satellite offices, tremendous amount of interlinkages. So there is a requirement to cater to these from a technology standpoint, from an infrastructure standpoint. And in addition to that, of course, when you talk about uh, the new guidelines that has to kick in to cater to the built environment, obviously looking at it from the perspective of environmental quality, catering to all of these uh, from the standpoint of environmental quality is also going to be very, very critical. So in, in North America, of course, um, and I'm pretty sure that this is true for any part of the world today, where some of the uh, industry associations, the organizations that support various uh, ecosystem players and partners have already started to work around uh, workplace strategies. For instance, companies have come together to create voluntarily some of the strategies that they want to uh, propagate in order to help uh, building owners, occupiers sort of um, open up their buildings um, under the current circumstances. So in North America, ASHRAE has of course come forward to put together the MEP Safe Start strategies, essentially looking at some of the critical components of the building. So whether it's a thermal um, environment, a humidity and moisture, for instance, um, pathogen uh, detection qualities, air filtration, which is very, very critical, of course. You know, traditionally we have had standards that support the need for minimum more 13 type of filters, but now the requirement is really to try and go to more 15 and 16 and so on. Uh, along with that, of course, you know, the uh, the surface borne viral load, which is, of course, the ultimately one of the critical aspects to control, uh, which also, uh, you know, ties in very closely with the behavioral viral load. I think looking at all of these strategies is really very critical uh, from the standpoint of uh, creating resiliency within these built environments going forward. And this is, of course, one of the things that uh, has been followed very closely by majority of the building owners, occupiers, and particularly the facility management companies um, concentrating on all of these MEP Safe Start strategies to really help open up these buildings um, in, a, in a safe manner for occupants. And in addition to that, of course, you know, there are critical areas um, that we are seeing um, building owners, occupiers and facility managers really focus on here. I mean, there are guidelines, there are guidelines that are unfolding at a state level, federal level, local government level, for instance, but then these are still very, very a work in progress type of guidelines because you know we don't know what the future really holds and how much of these guidelines in reality at the ground level uh, can be implemented without any roadblocks and barriers because you know controlling the built environment where there is a dynamic you know event at any given time to uh, concentrate on with occupants uh, being there um, is, is really not um, very easy to really follow through some of these guidelines that are put forward. So what we are seeing is that at the ground level, there are some critical challenges that are emerging in terms of really following through these guidelines. So there could be potential changes in these going forward. Uh, what we are seeing is that 
the standalone equipment, so whether it's your building automation or your HVAC or um, the air treatment control systems in the buildings, obviously these are being looked at very stringently. There are ways of eking out more efficiency out of these systems. So these are things that we are seeing a lot of facility managers and uh, building operators really concentrate on right now. Also really optimizing what you have in the building. Before you wait for new technology to emerge and hit this place, it's really looking at what you already have in the building in terms of your sensor network. How do you optimize that sensor network to really feed in the information that you need to to, to for crowd analytics, for instance, to for control measures in buildings, uh, to really detect safety hazards in the building. So these are things that already are being concentrated on right now. Uh, in terms of, of course, uh, the tremendous amount of pressure that this puts on the facility management um, service companies, uh, that's, of course, something that um, is going to continue. What we are seeing amongst facility management companies is that they are also trying to see if they can create some guidelines themselves, some certification tools and processes themselves in place uh, to certify their workforce better in, in terms of being prepared to handle some of these requirements of um, you know, healthy and safe buildings going forward. Uh, there is not a whole lot of examples, particularly coming out of North America at this time, to talk about um, in terms of you know what um, what new changes will be implemented to create what we would call a resilient smart building or a resilient intelligent building that is also COVID-19 compliant. But what we did see with the uh, with this particular case, uh, the this is Chicago's uh, Fulton Market District, uh, Fulton East building, which is a 90,000 square feet facility, uh, mixed use facility with a with 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 a, with a composition of commercial and retail. Um, in this building, what we did see is that they have actually um, implemented a lot of the technologies that already exist today to allow um, the building to be as close compliant to COVID-19 requirements as possible. So this includes everything from air purification systems that they went in for uh, the touch-free thermal scanning um, technologies that they implemented, elevator systems, for instance, very, very nascent company called Mad Elevators um, that actually came in to provide the door to go elevator system that is already in, uh, in place um, and, and something that can be leveraged. And so, so a lot of the existing technologies that are in place can actually quickly be leveraged to create these, these kind of resilient infrastructure. Uh, in addition to that, of course, there is a lot of touch-free technology and anti antimicrobial finishes that they have used. Um, so these are some of the things that, you know, obviously building owners, technology vendors will be looking forward to do try and incorporate more from what we have in the existing arsenal to, to really fortify these infrastructure um, premises going forward. But in addition to that, of course, we are closely looking at the startup landscape uh, to detect some of the new requirements that uh, will be necessary to, um, to implement and, and which would be some of these new wave technologies that will hit the space to actually support some of these requirements in, in healthy buildings going forward. Um, overall, I, I'd like to leave um, the audience with a couple of takeaways from what we are seeing. So uh, from an economic standpoint, of course, this is the worst hit uh, from what we can um, you know, assess, um, comparing it with past uh, you know, downtrends. But this is entirely unprecedented. And as we can see, I mean, the, the, the overall revival is going to be extremely slow because of the uncertainty of the event going forward. And although we are predicting a, a sort of a incline in the growth curves for various industries from post quarter three of 2021, this is still going to be an extremely slow process. But what is critical is really the reliance of digital technologies. Uh, we are seeing the incorporation of AI driven technologies to actually support some of the new normal requirements of buildings. And this is going to be uh, one that will unfold the key for new opportunities. You know, that will resonate better with the new requirements um, um, of, of buildings going forward. Forward. Um, as I said, I mean, there's tremendous amount of uh, changes that facility managers, facility management, asset management <coughs> companies will have to deal with in this situation. Uh, so really uh, looking at data to help them take and drive these decisions and to do things in a quick, resilient fashion is, is really going to hold the key. Uh, we are going to see a lot of reliance on standards like well and reset. We are seeing a lot of vendors, technology vendors actually, uh, promoting their products and technologies as compliant with well requirements or reset requirements. This is tr 
definitely going to be a trend because it is going to allow for that level of um, assurance for occupants, for tenants to feel safe within these buildings. So as if the technologies or the products and solutions are compliant with well requirements or research requirements, uh, this level of accreditation is going to be uh, really, really important and critical going forward. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, end my presentation and uh, hand it over to uh, Derek to to uh, continue with the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much. much. And for that, for that, uh, that uh, gives that us a lot, a lot of interesting things to think about there. Um, but we'll take questions at the end. Um, so let's move on now to Phil Abeda from SOM. Over to you, Phil. Great. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for the uh, the opportunity to come and and speak with the group here. I think it's a great subject. It's a great time to be speaking about um, intelligence and and resiliency. And I'm going to. Uh, share with you some of the thoughts we have here at, at SOM. If you bear with me one moment. So just a, a quick introduction. Uh, for those who, who don't know, SOM is, um, is a long 80 plus year uh, design practice of architects, engineers, urban planners. Uh, we've uh, taken a very particular look at, at what the post pandemic world uh, is going to shape to be, uh, how we as, as designers can respond, how we can set out a, a vision and, and roadmap, and, and clearly um, how climate change plays a role in this is, is shaping up the way that we set our uh, our approach to the buildings and the built environments. Um, so I'm Phil Abader, I'm one of the architects here at the London office uh, within the technical design group, and uh, really across the firm, this is a subject that is, is uh, very close to our hearts. So. Uh, so with that, I wanted to introduce what my take on the subject would be, and that's coming from uh, the principle of, of where resilience lies uh, in the future, um, how reliant we're going to become on intelligence uh, as a way to uh, to address those needs, and really now what the role of buildings uh, going forward can be in, in resiliency. Uh, what we understand or what we like to understand is that uh, resilience comes from an equitable relationship between communities and their built environments. Uh, and it's something that we understand It's something that works well in harmony. We take a look at what the, the pandemic has done, how it's reshaped our our dynamics of how we relate with with our community, how we relate with our buildings, and it's really reset a lot of our principles. So uh, so what have we learned in in this process? Uh, we can certainly take a look at the the impact that lifestyle choices have had to make uh, over the course of this year. And we can see that uh, the changes to to travel, the changes to commuting um, and, and to the, the major disruption and impact we've had to accommodate, that has had an impact on, on, on greenhouse and global gas emissions. But when we take a look at how far we have to go to get to our 1.5 degree targets from the Paris Accord, we're going to have to sustain these kinds of changes year upon year. So whilst this has been uh, quite a, an impact to accommodate. We're going to have to brace ourselves for year upon year of, of lifestyle impact and how ready are we to accommodate that. Um, the dichotomy between the health of being outdoors and the health of being indoors has never been brought into sharper focus. Uh, we certainly understand the benefits of outdoor, the the, the quality of air um, and how much we depend on on that outdoor experience. And yet we take a look and see just how in proportion the amount of time we spend indoors and outdoors really are. Uh, and it questions, you know, how much more now do we depend on the quality of our indoor environments for uh, for a healthier uh, well-being? We also take a look at what uh, the impact of, of digitization has had in the last, just in the last few months. You know, the adoption acceleration in some places has been uh, 10 years in somewhat irreversible and yet again that's been another form of, of of disruption form of adaptation that we've had to accommodate uh, and it's one that's going to certainly become a key part of of our everyday life and our everyday living but it begs the question when we look at our built environment why is it that it lacks resilience why is it that uh, the, the purpose and function of our buildings were rendered uh, obsolete in, in in just a few weeks and just a few months you know what then is the role of buildings as we move forward you know how is it that we can find new purpose uh you know how can they 
uh, how can they adapt and how can they teach us to adapt along the way? We do believe buildings hold a place in the future. Uh, whilst we've accepted and accommodated uh, working and living in remote fashions, you know, communities do engage around buildings, but how can we continue to engage with our buildings? How can they continue to uh, to find a path for us to uh, to find new relevance and new meaning in, in the built environment and how can they also become a path towards uh, resilience in the future. Perhaps then as we take a look at that role uh, and the relationship we have with buildings, perhaps the role for intelligence is something which can be a key to unlocking that and perhaps that plays a greater role than we had first anticipated. So I'd like to break down the idea of, of what intelligence uh, means. Um, particularly to a group who's probably as learned as, as this one. But if we look at intelligence as the act of learning, as the act of the application of knowledge, and think of this in its cyclical form, uh, we can see this as another interpretation of adaptation. And our ability to adapt is going to be key to resilience. We think about uh, buildings needing to adapt. We understand that we as a community need to learn how to adapt and the role that intelligence can play in allowing both buildings and communities to adapt uh, is going to be vital, but also just as vital it's, it's how buildings can be there to encourage us and enable us to adapt in the future. Uh, probably one of the greatest adaptations we're going to have to accommodate is the Paris Accord uh, target of addressing climate change. And looking across the three scopes that were set out in the, in the Accord, the third one, that of uh, adaptation of us as users of buildings, users of the built environment, is certainly going to be one of the key ones, one of the challenges, because our behaviour and our behavioural choices are going to be uh, ones that, that need the greatest influence to, to address those changes, and how are we ready to embrace those changes. Uh, what better place to start than perhaps a school? Uh, this is the, the Kathleen Grimm School uh, for Leadership and Sustainable um, Design at uh, Sandy Ground in New York. It's one of our projects that we're most proud of here at SOM, it's a benchmark for for sustainable ambitions, um, but it's also a key one for uh, for the discussion of, of resilience and, and future. Uh, one of the interesting aspects of this is that it's a building that actively looks to engage the students, the staff, the visitors uh, with the idea of, of how a building performs and how their actions can be better understood and how that in turn can influence and, um, and promote a, a different behavioural choice. Uh, as you can see on the graph on the, the right hand side, achieving net zero energy was uh, heavily reliant on the idea of, of post occupancy uh, and that engagement with with building operators, with the staff, with the students uh, beyond the design and handover of the building was a fundamental part of learning how to use a building, how to adapt uh, to to work with the, the performance of the building and, and seek a, a means of achieving a goal. Of, of net zero and it's been one that through monitoring through um through, through careful close relationship uh we've been able to achieve that but i think what's key is that it's a building that's and a school that acknowledged that perhaps it had to change some of its uh approaches to setting out its uh, structure of the day and its curricula and actually work in tune with the performance of the building find ways to understand when the best times to teach, where the best places to teach could be, and that could vary across the day, could vary across the seasons, uh, but looking to have greater um, uh, synchronization between building and occupation and usage was going to be key to uh, to adapting the nature of how we learn and the nature of how the building can, can teach us to adapt. Uh, engaging users with buildings can take many forms. Uh, this is an example of our 350 Mission Street lobby in San Francisco. It's one in which uh, digital art takes center stage uh, right there in the in the main space of the lobby. Um, it's a place that is uh, not just informative, it's also interactive. Uh, it's, it's there to find ways of, of changing and adapting the uh, the space, the mood of the of the internal environment, engaging individuals with that space, with that artwork uh, in a very dynamic way. But it's also one that tries to uh, link users with the engagement of the artwork, uh, find ways for information of the building's performance to be shared uh, with the users, ways to feedback information to the to the building. Uh, so it's looking to create a relationship in a responsive, uh, dynamic way uh, between the building uh, and its users. 
Uh, perhaps one of the great ways to engage users with their building is to uh, to really bring to center stage some of the most inconspicuous elements of, of a building, such as air filtration. Uh, so this is an example from our public safety answering center uh, in New York, which which does just that. Uh, it's uh, it's using one of our um, one of our uh, particularly prototyped uh, systems called the the AMP system. Uh, it's looking to integrate biophilia and and uh, and plants into the center of of our buildings, uh, have it linked to our HVAC systems, and uh, using the careful and, and and integrated technology, looking to clean the air around 200 times more effective than what plants would have been able to clean alone. Uh, and being designers, this is something that we we wanted to celebrate. We wanted to um, to prototype. We wanted to. Um, to bring to the forefront to find users um, being able to in engage with this elements of the of the building, understand how buildings work, uh, and and bring these to uh, to a level of integration in a building that uh, could perhaps suggest that there's uh, greater ways to celebrate well-being and and holistic health uh, for users inside these built environments. But what if buildings could then influence more? What if buildings could influence um, our relationship between habit habitation and mobility. So this is an example of a project. It's called AMI, which is the uh, acronym for Additive Manufacturing Integrated Energy. Uh, it was designed and developed in collaboration with the Department of Energy in the US and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, the principle behind this was uh, we had a, um, a, a habitated um, building envelope that was uh, integrated with solar PV cells. Uh, they're linking to um, to a remote vehicle, which again was a, a 3D printed vehicle. And using that synergy between the building and the, the vehicle, the idea was that this remote transmission would uh, allow the vehicle to transport the building and hence create a, um, a, a direct relationship between the building and the vehicle. Uh, needing this to be uh, a seamlessly designed uh, piece of, of design and engineering. Uh, it was key for us to look at this as something that we, we that we could approach in the same fashion as the automotive uh, industry. Uh, kits of parts uh, manufactured to allow for scalability, uh, and using the at the time um, fairly state of the art uh, principles of three D printing. Also looking to uh, to accommodate um, efficient design and minimizing waste along the process. And whilst this was uh, simply looked at at the scale of a small building and a, and a vehicle, we're now looking to take this to, to the second stage of our iteration, looking to see how can we scale this up? How can we see more and more parts of the community having uh, greater inter interrelated relationships between uh, distinct elements, creating closed loops between our built environments, uh, allowing individuals to to adapt their behaviors, to understand how systems can work in correlation with one another, rather than seeing um, elements of our built environments as islands upon themselves or as isolated components within the within the built environments. So within SOM, we're also looking further afield. We're asking ourselves questions about the, the post-pandemic world, uh, about the the um, about what the the resilient future could look like within the built environment. Uh, and how is it that we can uh, adapt the built environment to allow us to adapt and become more resilient in the future? How can we make better decisions? Uh, how can we understand the consequences of our choices? So looking at this across all scales, um, you know, right now we understand cities to be very much discrete components of, of, uh, of the built environment. But really, if we start to reimagine cities as, as cellular components, uh, elements where 15 minutes was all you need required to uh, to connect within your your smaller hub of, of work and live and retail and, and and lifestyle and and what if these hubs then became interconnected hubs such that individuals had uh, less reliance on greater community on greater commuting but greater um, integration with their own community and what if these live work hubs were there to improve the quality of life to create more sustainable more uh, dynamic and ultimately more resilient neighborhoods um, that could withstand change over the course of time. And certainly we see that the models for for where offices are, are moving, that uh, these can replace the need for 
uh, centralized business districts and, and remote uh, residential districts. You know, this, this closer integration is going to be uh, perhaps a key model uh, where places such as Paris and others are adopting similar principles of, of a 15 minute cities and 15 minute hubs. Then as we start to look closer into the elements that make up our typical built environment, uh, thinking about how we enter buildings, how we enter commercial buildings in, in particular, uh, understanding that, um, that, that choice and flexibility needs to become a greater part of the, uh, of, of the design, a greater, a greater part of how we integrate spaces that, uh, that can allow choice as we arrive in buildings. You know, how can these become breathable? How they, can they become navigable? Uh, how can we still maintain uh, safe, clear arrival and access into buildings where uh, distancing is, is still needing to be maintained, um, but still create a user experience as we arrive at buildings? Uh, as we start to look at the offices, which again, I think was alluded to earlier um, in the previous presentation, uh, a move away from the uh, the the current offer of, of either cellular or open plan offices is going to be uh, dependent on, on how the workspace can survive. You know, we think the elastic office is going to be far more prevalent. Uh, one way you can toggle between open and closed environments, uh, one where the, the, the needs can be adaptable over future, uh, far more demountable, uh, far more responsive, and, and certainly playing a different role to the offices that we currently see today. Uh, buildings will need to continue to be breathable. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier today, the uh, the need for a greater health um, uh, and, and, and breathability in buildings is going to become fundamental. Uh, having much more natural ventilation, having users perhaps far more attuned to working patterns, aligning with the cyclical elements of the environment, uh, understanding how biophilia can play a role in that, in uh, not just in, in air quality, but in all aspects of health and well-being. We see uh, travel fundamentally changing. Uh, the, the current uh, approach to very much a barrier driven uh, security for airports, we understand why that uh, that needs to take place today. But as, as technology can can find its way into uh, into alleviating the barriers and creating something that's more attuned to a free passage, you know, how can we have airports and and other forms of of terminals uh, allowing for greater uh, barrier-free experience you know, and how can this become the antithesis to how we uh, perceive uh, travel today. Education has also taken a, uh, a fundamental rethink across the, the pandemic. Uh, the remote working may well have offered a solution in terms of technology, but we still believe that schools, uh, whether it's for primary or for, or for, um, uh, for further education, uh, those schools are a fundamental part of developing so social, um, social, emotional, intellectual um, growth, and a hybrid approach to schools where technology can allow for customized uh, education, but the environment can be there to to cater for um, for what we as as, a, as individuals and as a community require. You know, we do believe that a different type of school could well become um, one that emerges from the post pandemic. And as we think of uh, further education, higher education, uh, certainly the need for uh, for campus, the need for communities where um, thoughts and creativity are given space to flourish, uh, where the physical environment is there to cater for um, uh, for the health and well-being, but having spaces that are far more adaptable, far less reliant on on confined approaches to to education, uh, and where technology can play a role in in trying to create a a, a more customized approach to learning. And then going back to the idea that I had at the beginning, that this equitable relationship between um, uh, the community and their built environments, uh, that's going to become even more fundamental when we look at residential and uh, and all aspects of, of living. Uh, the idea that the dichotomy between work and live is is going to create a an opportunity for the third space communities where uh, elements that can tie those two that aren't required to be accommodated just within the home. You know, those can start to become knitted into communities and uh, it can provide a, res a, resp a support um, which can offer a higher quality of life for, uh, for individuals, for communities as well. 
and these are some of our insights um, into how we think the resilient future is going to shape. Uh, we think that there is going to be a, a future for buildings. We do think that uh, there is an opportunity to to see how they can allow us the future, uh, to allow us to, to thrive, to flourish, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing where this uh, opportunity can take us. And at that, I'll hand over back to Derek. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, very interesting. And I like your term, the elastic office. That's really uh, good. You can see in those first two presentations the importance of doing much more measurement in buildings and also the great importance uh, in the role that uh, facilities managers play. Right, for our last presentation, I hand over to Neil, uh, Neil Pennell from Landsec. Neil, over to you. Hello, Neil. Unmute. Right, okay. Okay. Got it now? Yeah, okay, fine. Thank you. Can you hear me? Right, good afternoon, everyone. Sure. Sorry about the uh, technical. A hitch at the beginning. Um, my name is Neil Pennell for Landsec, Head of Design, Innovation and Property Solutions. Landsec, for those of you not familiar, we're a uh, one of the UK's leading uh, real estate investment trusts and we own a, a significant portfolio in the UK, uh, including office spaces primarily in London and retail and leisure spaces across the UK and, and some residential. So that's Landsec and, and what we do. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the sort of challenge that COVID-19 has presented to us, some of the lessons that we've been learning as we've adapted the existing buildings that we have, where intelligent solutions could play a part and what are the sort of opportunities and barriers around that, uh, trying to think forward about using data to help decision making and making sure that the information is available to the users that need it. I think we're aware of the pandemic cycle now and we're sort of somewhere between the end of the first wave and perhaps the beginning of the second wave. Uh, we're in a sort of interim transition phase and I think once we've got over this particular pandemic, I think probably the lesson learned is that we have to be prepared for future ones. I don't think this challenge is the only one that's going to come along. Um, it's probably, you know, everybody I think understands the transmission paths. There's still research to do to see uh, which of these paths is, is the primary cause of infection, but it's definitely going to be the um, touch and airborne processes that, that take that uh, virus from person to person. And understanding those is also key to understanding where interventions can be made. I think perhaps one of the unexpected set of consequences we've seen on the environment is that uh, even with all the shutdown across the world, I think on April the 7th, global emissions reduced by about 17% which is great, but it does show how far we have to go to get down to a zero carbon world. And in the meantime, we've probably been creating a lot more waste with all the PPE and everything else that's come into play. There's been pressure on, on some wildlife habitat through lack of supervision of, of some of the key habitats that we have. And I suppose, interestingly, in terms of the world of intelligence and, and data and digital, uh, obviously data center uh, use has, has increased and will probably be a growth sector further into the future. I thought I'd sort of, for, before looking forward, look, look back a little bit. And I think that w one of the major sort of functions of the built environment in the past has been to help to protect us from infection and disease. And I think maybe we've become a little bit lazy with that, with easy access to antibiotics over the last 50 plus years. Um, we've sort of perhaps not taken the level of thought and precaution into our buildings that Obviously, we see now the, the benefit of and the preparedness that's needed going forward. So I think we do need to look at, at how we do that, improving the, the health and well-being for people within the buildings. And not only within the buildings we have and the buildings that people use, we've also got to think about how we design buildings going forward and how we actually construct them. And an area that I've been focused on in recent times is design for manufacturing assembly. I think it was mentioned earlier, the sort of kit parts approach to building. Again, if you can do much more pre-manufacture off-site, it means 
less people being needed on site and with social distancing and maintaining the efficiency of construction it seems that I think this will be given a further impetus as we go forward. I chair the British Council for Offices Technical Affairs Committee and we produced a couple of papers uh, in response to some of the, the challenges that we saw coming through from COVID and the adaptations that were needed and obviously amongst them it's, it's about understanding the sort of measures that you could do to adapt spaces but we also I think try to highlight that we need to think ahead as to with the buildings that we're developing now and those that are yet to go on the drawing board we need to start thinking about what are the things that we could do differently that would make those buildings more resilient more easy to adapt and, and more flexible to be able to respond to the challenges that we see and part of that was an element of smart solutions but I think that it's, it's one part of the tools in the in the bag if you like uh, design and and thinking about how we use buildings are just as important so you know we've obviously seen a challenge from our perspective as a property owner obviously we we provide office spaces for people we think we provide good spaces but obviously we're now competing with people working from home and this sort of big challenge in between uh, moving from home into the office often is uh, a public transportation system that puts you in close contact with people and makes social distancing difficult so until we we have some answers to the virus that's that's going to be an enduring challenge but the workplaces themselves, I think a lot of work's been done. And as we were going through the transitional phase and getting people back into the offices, those things are working well in terms of space planning the buildings, putting in place enhanced hygiene, um, big question marks about vertical transportation in buildings and high rise buildings, but finding workarounds for that as, as people adapted their work style, um, varied the, the place of work between home and, and with the office as we started to move back until uh, as you probably know as from tomorrow we're back into a second lockdown in the UK so it's sort of three spe steps forward and two back again so as I say one key area that, that people focused on has been challenging within buildings particularly uh, high-rise buildings was the use of lifts so we did produce a paper on that looking at some of the steps you can take to minimize the risk in the in the use of vertical transportation systems and again looking at some of the technology interventions that could perhaps help to provide that extra level of reassurance and this is an example from Otis but most of the, the major manufacturers are already putting these types of solutions forward um, putting on UV lamps onto uh, handrails on escalators and trying to find ways of finding touch free operation for people to use lifts. Um, even some promoting the use of air purification within the lift cars. Um, I think a lot of the things that have been done up to now have been relatively low cost interventions, but you know this sort of screens that we've seen, anchoring microbial surfaces and in increased hygiene, lots of management initiatives in terms of managing the peaks of people arriving to buildings and and what the maximum utilization of space can be whilst taking into account social distancing. Um, but uh, quoting Derek here, I thought would be would be good and with the focus of this group being primarily on intelligent buildings and and certainly the digital aspects associated with that. I think that buildings have been labelled as intelligence in the past, but the application of intelligence has yet to deliver its true potential in the words of Derek. I think that this pandemic will be a great stimulus to people to take forward that thinking. It's about really looking at what is an intelligent building and, and an intelligent building focuses not just on the building itself, but its interaction with the people that use it and the systems that provides a safe and productive workplace or a safe and productive place to enjoy your leisure time or work or live or play if you like in, in using the built environment. Um, defining intelligent buildings I think probably we all find struggling because there are so many different aspects to a building. It can affect all aspects of building including the building's design and, and assembly as I've talked about previously and obviously technology can impact on all aspects of buildings and how they're used. So very difficult to come up with a single definition, um, but maybe it's about more informed decision process sharing between the systems, making buildings more sensitive, more able to respond. There's been, got to be a big focus on making sure that the, say, the space is safe and people can occupy it and enjoy um, this experience. Technology will be part of making that happen. 
um, and the use of internet connected technologies will actually help us to be more adaptive and responsive, improving performance. I was asked to look at the barriers. I think adopting smart building technology into to what we do, you always get within the world of um, certainly design and construction, there's reluctance to change for building owners like ourself. Sometimes new ideas and new technologies are easier to introduce into new developments to try and retrofit into existing buildings is expensive and there's always a challenge around getting that, that return on the investment. Um, there's lack of knowledge, um, the technology itself moves on quickly, so you invest in it and it, it rapidly becomes obsolete. Maybe cloud solutions in the future will provide a way that that can be overcome to some degree. There's lack of happy time people to take it on. Um, there's difficulties integrating the different building automation systems together. Um, I think, you know, you see the example of, say, the mobile phone industry of each of the different mobile phone providers had their own individual protocols, then the phones wouldn't speak to each other. Uh, but we have that in buildings with the systems. Everything's got different protocols. And as hard as we try to try and push the case to, to get open protocols and interconnections, we're always having to overcome it with intermediary solutions. I think there are, the way that we construct buildings and refurbish them and, and extend them falls within existing contract models, which are difficult to actually take on board the intelligent building solutions that you really want to integrate into buildings. So I think we'll have to review how, how we actually procure buildings, at, whether it's a refurbishment or new build, to be able as to add in more smart building technology. There is obviously challenges around cyber security. The more we rely on integrated and interconnected technology, the potential risk for people that, that want to do bad things to us, if you like. And obviously, in terms of some of the things that technology can do to help us to combat COVID-19, sometimes sort of crosses the line between uh, personal data and anonymized data, uh, and that can bring issues around the GDPR regulation. So there are barriers to taking those things on, but I think we can start to overcome those barriers. Uh, we, we need to create strong business cases on investing in the digital tools and the smart building solutions. Uh, if we start looking at a building's life cycle cost rather than just its first cost, we need to be able to analyse the data to really get un an understanding of what can be done and set some smart targets that we can achieve by the introduction of new systems, new solutions. Um, I think customer and market expectations are going to be high in this area now. People have become sensitised to a level of hygiene, to the ventilation of spaces, to making sure that they're healthy spaces to be in. We can always change contracting models that just needs work to make that happen. And as we do this and people see the benefits coming through, then I'm sure that it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of people wanting to, to invest more and, and make their buildings more COVID secure and for future um, pandemics. But in any case, if you create a more healthy and um, building then it's going to be healthy, not just for this particular illness, but other illnesses that we already have to have to deal with will be will be reduced. So what are the opportunities? I think informing people so people can make good choices about what they want to do and how they want to use places. The touch free experience I mean, has been talked about a lot um, because of one of the methods of contracting this virus and, and other infections is through touching contaminated surfaces. Uh, trying to understand how we manage people flow and how they use buildings and spaces. And obviously being very clear that we can understand that cleaning has been done at, at, to a proper level and a proper cycle. Um, all of those are really out there to, to get that operational effectiveness of the building as good as it can be. I think there are opportunities in, in retail. So people are, are aware of the requirements of hygiene, we've all started to change our behaviours, we're wearing masks, we queue up to go into spaces. There is still though, I think, um, you know, there's a, a challenge from the world of digital retail, but I think people still like to go into a retail world, they still try to like to interact with real things. So it, the, the challenge I think for the retail industry will be a, able to, how they react to that and create their spaces such that people feel confident and secure in going into them and they can provide the experience that they're looking for. 
we certainly, as we reopened our, our retail centres, we've seen a, a return to the shops um, and also our designer outlet centres. We've actually seen good conversion rates in, in people coming in and buying things. So from a retail perspective, there's there's been good success once we've reopened that, that retail world um, that we're now in the process of closing down for another four weeks. But it's it's a process that I think was said earlier, if we, you need to be able to adapt and switch things in and out quickly to suit a particular point in a pandemic cycle. Um, we've also seen obviously a great increase in um, touchless type technology. The smartphone will be, I think, a key part of, of going into the retail environment. Already we can pay touchlessly. Some people want to go to, to touch and feel things, but others may may not want to come into physical contact and, and therefore retailers will need to provide solutions to help them uh, get the type of experience they're comfortable with in their stores. So what about the workplace? What about the office? Is it the end of the office or a new beginning? I think the latter, I think the way that we use the space will change. I think there will be a much more flexible um, level between how people work and use the, the facilities that the office space provides. And these are some of the benefits that you get from being in a workspace and, and the creative energy that comes from bringing people together. I think it's particularly important for people that are sort of new to the workplace, new to their organisations and want to learn and understand uh, from others, you know, how, how they best fit into that organisation, how that how they provide their input, if you like, into the productivity of the business, but also are able to develop their careers and understanding and knowledge. Um, you can do a lot through a screen, but there are some things that are just not the same. Um, so will that be a result in more space being required, less space or no change? I think the question's still out there. I, I think that there's been a progression to intensify the occupancy levels in offices over the last few years, which which may reverse to some degree, I think, a bit more personalised space, particularly during periods where you have community transmission of a pandemic disease, as we have now. Um, there will be much more flexibility, I think, from employers for people to work from home and to work from the office. So I think the way we use our, our built workspace will change, but I don't think it will disappear as a need. I think it plays too too much of an important role. So in terms of that new thinking, you know, I, I just put a load of quotes together. It was actually for a, another presentation, but I, I looked at this again and um, just went through and highlighted the sort of references within these various statements that sort of pointed towards a, a new set of intelligent buildings using technologies to help people to cope with the challenges that we face from living in a world with COVID. Um, and I think has already been mentioned, the, the office building in Chicago has been actively marketed as a building that's taken into account uh, steps to make it a more resilient and a attractive environment for people to go to. And I think if developers and owners see that, that these things um, create demand for their product, then that's what the investment will go into. Um, then obviously there's the other sort of uh, view that the one-off pandemic has no impact at all. It has to keep coming back for us to take any notice. Well, I would say if you cast your mind back to those lessons from the past, you know, we the reason why the built environment changed in those days was because problems kept coming back. You know, we had TB, we had other infectious diseases, so great amounts of light, uh, good good fresh air levels, buildings that were designed to reduce contact with the surfaces that can become contaminated, the choice of materials. You know, we used to have brass doors and copper surfaces and, the, you know, these things were put in place in buildings because they actually made a difference. But we, as I say, we've forgotten some of that. I think if we're going to invest more in technology than we already do, then we have to build the use cases. And there's lots and lots of ideas out there of things that you can do. One thing that frustrates me to some degree is that we already have lots of sensors and controls in, in most buildings these days. And I think we just need to work harder to get more from that before trying to reapply additional IoT solutions that are just another layer over the top of that doing the same thing. I think the IoT solution should be focused where we have gaps and we should really look at trying to capture the information from all the sources that we've already invested in. Some opportunities for smart building technology. 
obviously we can look at capturing temperatures from people, but that comes with its GDPR challenges and a lot of issues around false positives. Smart cleaning, I, I talked about before, and that capacity and people flow management. I think somebody mentioned earlier about, you know, crowd monitoring and, and highlighting areas for people um, that need to perhaps uh, avoid a certain area for a certain period of time. You know, if people want to go to the washroom, uh, you know, you're trying to control the flow of people and they don't want loads of people standing around in a small space. Um, so again, providing people with information so that people can judge the time when they want to use facilities within a building. From a building management perspective, having sort of real time or close to real time data dashboards that tells you what's going on in, in your portfolio buildings will enable you to act remotely. When when we had to sort of reduce the operational levels in our, in our office buildings, um, it was necessary for people to go to the buildings to, to carry out changes to control regimes and the like. Actually, it'd be much better if a lot of that could be done remotely. Um, we already have some capability of doing that, but I think it's an opportunity now to sort of think again if you if you have a, a portfolio of buildings as to how you can make that a bit more seamless. As I said, the point, the IoT sensors and devices, a lot of people putting those things forward. I would see them as something that should be focused on the things that we don't already know, and we should get the information for the things that we do know in a presentable form where it can be used. Indoor air quality is obviously critical. We've all seen that Great ventilation in a space is, is one of the, the major aspects of providing you with the first level of defence, if you like, in terms of catching any virus, but particularly COVID-19. Um, so monitoring that, and I, I think I've seen recent um, papers put forward that, you know, a good proxy for the, the uh, ventilation efficiency in a space is to measure the CO2 level. Uh, and I think, again, we can gain understandings where we have good spaces, not so good spaces, how spaces are being used. And because resilience is important, we need to get ahead of the game, use the information we have to do predictive maintenance so that we can keep really core key systems working and working effectively. So if we're looking at intelligent building strategy at this point in time, I think we've got to look in three areas. There's probably the largest challenge is the buildings that we already have. And what do we do with those? How do we adapt them? What do we retrofit? Uh, current projects that are sort of already progressing through and maybe are moving on site or going through the later stages of design uh, needs to be looked at urgently to see what steps can be taken to improve um, their resilience to these challenges going forward. And then for future development, start to reimagine how, how buildings can be depending on you know what they're aimed at. I think we saw in uh, the previous presentation some of the ideas about how schools and offices and other spaces can start to respond to these new new challenges that we face and also how we need to behave differently if you like in the way that we use buildings i think data will be a really important part of that and if we can use data to actually drive our decision making then hopefully we'll make better decisions this is um just a little bit of a sort of perspective that Gartner put together a few years ago trying to look at how you could use data to assist in the decision making process you know find out what happened why did it happen what will happen and then what should I do and then ultimately enabling a system to take a decision um, where where you feel it, it can act correctly and quickly to to improve a situation um, just looking at an example here we're just we were looking at some intelligent processes and we thought we'd sort of try and look at how would we improve the way that we just get data from energy together you know if we do this properly we can actually get reactive maintenance we can look at proper life cycles we can uh, start to diagnose from the data what we need to do that can give us predictions that enables us to actually put that together with the physical space within a building and models that we have and which is a building information model now but might become a digital twin in the future we're going to be able to start using machine learning and analysis to take decisions for us and these same thought processes can be applied to any control process and the ones that are dealing in in actually trying to maintain the quality of the space the indoor air quality the health and well-being of the occupants in the building are going to come right to the top of the priority list so it's all about making interactions as frictionless as possible 
and it's good to talk at the end of the day if we're able to gather all this data if we're able to use the systems we have and try to plug the data together to make more informed decisions then we have to make that information visible to all the people at the right time when they need to use it and i guess that's that's also a challenge but we have the tools to overcome that i think we already have many of these things in place and i think these are all going to become part of the answer to us being able to use buildings much more intelligently as well as the buildings themselves being more intelligent. So as we look forward, are we going to go back to normal or will it be a new normal? Well, to some degree, how how much we do go back to the old normal might depend on what we can do in terms of mitigations for the virus and particular the success or otherwise of um, an immunization program with vaccine. Um, but in the meantime, and, and maybe well into the future, technology is going to be, play its part to help us to deal with these situations. And um, that was all I had to say for now. It'd be interesting to see what your questions are. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Neil, uh, for that very fascinating overview. Um, can Connor has unfortunately had to leave us because she's got another meeting and I'm sorry we are running slightly late on the question time. Uh, <clears throat> not a lot of questions in the chat column, um, but uh, Lawrence Liesk uh, does remind us that uh, we've, we've seen a lot of nice concepts and changing scenes in these presentations which are a challenge, but it's also brought us down to earth a little bit that uh, ventilation is very important, as you've all said. Uh, but there are practical things like in used buildings, when you're trying to update buildings, uh, belt drives, it brings up as a, a big factor um, that is common. And of course, if you have a breakdown with your air supply, this is rather important. Uh, I don't know whether Lawrence wants to come back to add anything more to that. Uh, if you do, uh, if you signal by hand or in the chat column, um, I'll, I'll let you in. Um, I was going to say something about, uh, certainly people perhaps don't realize their relationship with buildings and how important it is. And several of you mentioned this, and perhaps we're not very good at helping our customers to understand how to work with their building more effectively. So maybe there's a big area of concern there uh, to, to look at. Now, I will go back to uh, Lawrence, who's got his hand up. Lawrence, are you there? Uh, yeah, yes, I am. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes, we, well, I can hear you. Would you like to say something else? Yeah, I just would like to try and raise this issue that I think there's a really good opportunity to retrofit. Partic you know, I've done thousands of surveys in the UK, and I'd say probably 75% of those buildings have got um, single belt drive fans. And if the belt goes, then they will lose, you know, the ventilation until they can get someone in there. And I think it's, I think, you know, retrofits really important. It is only, f I think, 5% of the building stock is renewed each year in the UK. Um, and I just would like to try and raise the issue. I think it's also could create jobs as, as well with the, the EC fans do provide feedback through Modbus or through BMS. And I just want to raise the issue. Mm. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Neil, have you got anything to come back on that or? Um, I think obviously people will probably look for resilience more in the ventilation systems they have done previously. I mean, a lot of uh, extract systems, uh, I mean, washrooms in particular are obviously a confined space. You have all potential um, transmission paths present in that area. Um, we have run standby fans usually on, on extract systems. I think there might be a bigger push to actually have proper supply air brought into those spaces rather than lying on, on air being transferred. So I think ventilation and the focus on it will grow. In terms of resilience in the central plant type location, you could put run and standby motors in it in a, and it hopefully it could fit within the same fan section. You could um, take those sections out and replace them with, with fan decks with multiple small 
fans probably of the nature that that uh, Lawrence is suggesting. So I think when people start to realise the importance of ventilation and that it needs to be a much more resilient system than is uh, perhaps it's usually thought needed, I think that that will uh, start people investing in those things. Uh, OK, thanks very much. Now, Shamoon uh, Karimji has asked a question. What elements of electrical building services do you think uh, would need to be reviewed post COVID? Anyone like to either of you take on that question or anyone else for that matter? I think the security system will, will be an important one because of its interface with access to and from a building. If you're mm -hmm. going to try and make more seamless access into a building, then we're going to be relying on the use of um, contactless type approaches to get through into a building, automation of, of doors um, and being able to call call lifts without having necessarily touch buttons, etc. So I think that um, a lot of those things being able to identify people and to give them the authority to pass through spaces in that more seamless way will require those systems to be reviewed and better integrated. So I think that certainly the electronic control system elements of, of electrical services will come under renewed scrutiny. In terms of the base building electrical distribution, um, I mean, normally that's quite a resilient system in the way that, that buildings are heavily dependent on, on power to function for all sorts of reasons. Um, but it may be in buildings that don't have um, that good of resilience, perhaps there would be some retrofit there on electrical infrastructure. Right. Yeah, I think t taking that same idea forward, I think the uh, we, we're certainly seeing as as more developers approach us on uh, on, on the topic of, of of refurb of adaptive reuse, uh, the, the 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 ground plane experience is fundamentally quite different to what we had how we'd approached it back in the 80s and in the 90s and certainly in the 90s and looking back in, on Canary Wharf and in those areas, the, the idea of a, a far more um, secured front door is, is quite a different approach to to the idea of, of barrier free experiences and, and far more um, uh, uh, openness, but finding ways to, to keep security uh, better integrated. And I, I agree, I think technology is going to allow that barrier free uh, um, the experience of ground floor planes to exist. I think also as office spaces need to be adaptable, we'll have to again think about how um, electrical services get distributed within buildings such that they can facilitate a very different approach to, to plug and play um, uh, expandable and elastic uh, office spaces. Thank you. Um, can I now invite Abdul Hadi uh, Nawawi uh, to comment, he's put here a, a lovely presentation, excellent presentations. Can you comment critically the management's ability to embrace a whole host of newer measures and operating standards, not only for the safety of the employers, but also to maintain business continuity? Um, and uh, several uh, you have in your presentations referred indirectly to some of these things and the barriers that Neil spoke about. Uh, one of our challenges is to cope with a new approach, a new way of thinking things which we've done for years in a particular way. And the pandemic is making us stop, rethink, hang on a minute. Perhaps we need to think about this a bit more carefully, a bit more deeply, whatever it is. That certainly applies in case of ventilation. Um, and also standards. I mean, the problem with standards is they, they take a long time to derive and then they're kind of set for a long time. But the pandemic's showing us that things can move very quickly. And in addition, of course, technology is moving very quickly. So we've got to be quite light footed with how we cope with dealing with standards. Um, anyway, uh, over to uh, either you, Neil or Phil, would you like to make some comments on Abdul's uh, question. Do you want to go first or? Um, yeah. Happy to, happy for you to. OK, um, um, I, I think that, um, yes, people have got to think differently. 
I think there will be, you know, that the whole of the world's population has been re-educated in the importance of taking care in terms of hygiene, uh, understanding uh, the the virulence of these types of e events and the dangers that they present. So I think people will have a growing expectation of what they expect from the spaces that they go into, whether that's the physical changes that are made to the building, whether it's the smart systems that are embedded within them to help them remain safe and secure in those buildings and to promote the health and well-being of the spaces that they're using. But it's going to be responsibilities on people who own, manage and operate those spaces to also ensure that they, they meet those expectations. So I think for those uh, companies and organisations um, and public bodies that are able to respond to that, they, they will be the most successful going forward in terms of attracting and retaining uh, customers, staff if it's a workplace um, and um, obviously if, if you're building homes for people the same. I think people will probably be looking for homes to, to change going forward with perhaps more generous spaces for people to, to work in if they need to work from home. Um, so the whole process of how we think about our built environment, we do need to take into account the lessons that we're learning from this process. So I think that those that see that and act quickly will be those that are the most successful. And certainly, you know, you always need to understand what, what your user base, what your customers want, and those that provide the right solutions are those that are sustainable into the future. Bill, yeah. you want to? Yeah. Yeah. I, was, okay. I was going to say, I mean, certainly we're learning lessons about uh, the flexibility of, of where we work and how we work and when we work. And um, the, the confines that we previously understood that each person you know, has a dedicated desk and works between dedicated times, uh, it's hard to see that becoming a, um, a normality again. We certainly think that when we look at the makeup of offices, the, the quantum of, of flexible workspaces compared to dedicated workspaces and the balance of meeting spaces, I mean, that's certainly going to, to shift. You know, the idea of, of needing to accommodate uh, far more flexibility is uh, is going to be key. The way that people um, book their spaces, uh, again, technology can allow that to to take place. So perhaps we don't need to have as many people uh, within a building at any one given time. Perhaps offices can can, can provide uh, uh, space uh, far less in terms of square meterage to accommodate the same workforce because they can manage with technology. Uh, a different degree of occupation and that in a sense can also start to alleviate the uh, the population within buildings with the density loads in, in the transport arriving into the building. So certainly I do see that, that there's going to be a, a shift in, in those peaks as, as people arrive sort of to and from uh, their work. Thank you, thank you. Now Alex Smith has raised a question uh, he, he's talking about hospitality spaces, hospitality spaces like restaurants and cafes, which often lack me mechanical ventilation, often have closed windows. I've certainly experienced that. Very, very uncomfortable. Never mind all the infection as well that could take place. How can we intelligently retrofit these buildings to make them safe, especially if they become third spaces for home workers? So flexibility of home and, and office and other spaces. How can we educate owners and users of the importance of good ventilation? Now, this is very difficult because obviously thinking about restaurants and bars and cafes, they're all under enormous economic pressures at the moment, as we all realize. So they're probably not going to be welcoming spending more money on things. On the other hand, there does have to be a, a change of attitude that uh, these things are more vital than we realize, good air uh, circulation and so on. Um, how, how do you think we can overcome that in making the message of the importance of air flow and so on uh, highly important, uh, not just in big offices, obviously in schools, obviously in the home, uh, but also in these other social cultural centres? Yeah, certainly the, the decarbonising of, of of transport is is going to be keen to uh, key to cleaning our our air and and, and you know we, we mentioned briefly on, on commercial spaces but we do think that a return to natural ventilation is going to be 
uh, it's going to be fundamental and, and probably much much more feasible in the near future as as um, electrification is um, is more prevalent. Uh, we, we certainly see the results for you know for education and and what benefits natural ventilation brings. Uh, we're certainly pushing even within retrofits uh, to see if we can have greater volume of air. You know, maybe up to thirty percent more fresh air coming into buildings than what we previously would have allowed for from mechanical systems. But uh, but natural ventilation is is uh, certainly key in in new builds. I can understand the challenges with the uh, with with the refurb, but perhaps greater volume of air um, coming into those buildings is is going to be a first step. I think I think there's there's challenges to some degree with natural ventilation as well because it can be intermediated by the way people use the buildings. It gets cold, so they shut the windows. You know, so you you know there's challenges as well as benefits from natural ventilation. I think I think buildings in the future should provide some easy access to good outside space where people can work as well as inside. I think that will be key. I mean, we generally in our buildings, and I've always been a keen advocate of. Um, lots of uh, fresh air supply into the space. We, we put probably 50-60% more fresh air into our buildings typically than most of our competitors and, and I think that's important because it provides that flexibility and resilience in the building but it also uh, speaks to creating a better indoor air quality which is really important going forward. So I think it's going to be a mixture of all different aspects um, where you can go outside and work in a semi-covered environment when the weather is is good and some some place in the world it's good all the time. So, you know, working inside and outside I think will be good. Uh, but ventilation of space, we need to look at it much more as a science and actually understand how airflows move around buildings, um, how we should design the systems to work. I think in, in the world of of retail though as you pointed out that finance is always a, a challenge um, I suspect that it's going to take some degree of regulation properly to to make any significant change in those sorts of spaces to happen over a period of time I think some some will use the opportunity where they have the free board to invest to improve the facilities and use that as a if you like part of the sales pitch to come to their particular restaurant or shop but for, for many, it, it will be seen to be a burden and, and we may have to drive that thinking through regulation. OK, uh, Lawrence, you want to come back? No? No, he's got his hand up. No, he doesn't. OK, OK. Well, we are now coming to the end of our meeting. Um, just to mention, Shamoon has said, I can see more energy consumption post-COVID would you agree? Can you just give a brief answer to that? Um, to, to some degree, but I, th I think it's all about uh, you know, what Phil was saying earlier. It's about the flexibility of response. You know, we need to do certain things at certain times. You know, the recommendation at the moment is that um, you run plant and equipment on for um, times outside of the normal occupant sphere to keep purging the spaces and refreshing the air in the spaces. Obviously, in periods where you don't have mass transmission within the community, you, you don't need to carry on all of those things. So it's a matter of responding to the particular phase of the pandemic that you're dealing with and, you know, using energy sensibly where it needs to be used. You use it and as soon as you can go to a more efficient operational cycle you do that it's about control it's about management and about the systems that are designed and put in buildings in the first place being as efficient as they can be so if they do have to be used more for whatever reason then the impact on energy use is absolutely minimized right i think if, if we if we keep using buildings the way we do today then then yes it's easy to see how that can uh greater consumption can can be the result but but changing our mindsets, thinking about spaces that have uh, far, far greater diversity of uses across the day, such that you know we are we're getting a greater balance of how we use and consume energy um, in, at, you know, in day and night conditions, uh, making buildings far more active so that energy doesn't get wasted. You know, see how we can try to transfer uh, and, and share energy between between functions within a building. I think there's, there's strategies to conserve, and that's also going to come to changing our uh, our approach to how um, functions and spaces are segregated today, but how they can be better integrated in the future. 
Right. I think we're now going to come to the end of our uh, webinar, uh, not to leave on a, a negative note, but I was reading today in some medical journals, there are 7,000 plus more possible viruses that could <laughs> uh, come on the scene. Um, so uh, some of you have mentioned this isn't going to quickly go down. We have to live with infection risk as being an important part of the design and use process in, in, in buildings. Um, and my particular area I was going to talk about later was ventilation, because it isn't just the quantity of air you put into the building. That's very important, of course. And natural ventilation can work in some circumstances extremely well. But we've got to pay more attention to how what happens to the air in the building. You see, all the researchers that are looking at airborne transmission and surface deposition at MIT and Japan and so on, they're doing fantastic visualization studies of what's happening with the infection risk. We aren't doing anything much like that in ventilation at all. So we, we've got to balance that up to see how the air we put into the building, what it does inside the spaces to link up with those um, viruses uh, patterns in, in the space. So that's an area where we, we have to perhaps do things in a, a lot more detail um, than, than we have before. Um, we've mentioned uh, antiviral surfaces. Uh, Neil referred to copper, and that's been used in the um, Crick Building in London for uh, handling handles and so on. And uh, Kana mentioned paint shield. I don't know if anyone knows about that, uh, which, which is interesting. So there is going to be a lot of um, products coming on the market claiming to do things. And I think that's another danger is, especially when we're talking about filtration, we're talking about UV radiation techniques for cleaning air and so on, uh, talking about ionization possibilities. We've really got to make sure that we have the evidence if we're going to install these things in buildings and use them. Um, so that, that's uh, that. So on that, um, there's a lot more we could say. Uh, this will be put online, so you'll have some links. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for attending. And I'd like to thank our presenters who've given three excellent papers. And those who also came in to, answer, uh, to re request some questions and added some comments, which is very useful. So thank you all for coming. Our next seminar is going to be on November the 25th, and it's going to be on low carbon, organized by Mina Asman from SOM, uh, as she is a member of the CIBC Intelligent Buildings Group. So thank you all. Have a good evening and keep safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you again, Derek.